Welcome back to the Depth and Light Podcast. I'm your host, J.D. Pirtle. In this episode, we'll be exploring the Electronic Visualization Lab at the University of Illinois at Chicago. This episode is going to be in two parts. Why two parts? Well, the Electronic Visualization Lab, or EVL as it's commonly known, has been a hub of innovation in arts and technology for 46 years. EVL has a tremendous history filled with groundbreaking inventions and connections to culturally significant things like Star Wars, the dawn of personal computing, and early video gaming. So we're going to break this subject into two episodes. Full disclosure, this episode is a personal one for me. I got my master's at UIC, spending much of my time as a research assistant at EVL. After I graduated, I received an appointment as a research associate and worked at EVL for several years. One of the things that I thought was really unique about EVL during my time there is how ego-free everyone seemed to be. You would think that a lab at the forefront of virtual reality, visualization, and ultra-high-speed research networks would be a place with fierce competition in politics. But not EVL. They welcome me and everyone else into the lab and have always been incredibly supportive, like any good family. EVL was founded in 1973 by Dan Sandine and Tom DeFonte. The original name was Circle Graphics Habitat, which is a nod to the former name of UIC. In 1965, the new campus for UIC opened under the name University of Illinois at Chicago Circle. The circle part of that name came from the fact that the campus sits with one corner in the circular interchange of two interstates, I-290 and I-9094. I recently sat down with Dan to talk about his work in EVL. Here's Dan talking about the founding of the Circle Graphics Habitat. So what were the goals of that organization that's kind of predecessor to the Electronic Visualization Lab? Well, really the goals were the same as the Electronic Visualization Lab. Um, And we were uh, supported by science again. Mm -hmm. Um, In this case, to uh, kind of uh, aid scientists in visualizing and understanding their data and creating educational materials uh, for, uh, for undergraduate classes primarily. Um, and so we did that. And in the process, of course, since Tom was uh, in a PhD in computer graphics, one of the early ones, uh, developing the technology was a major component. And with me being an exhibiting artist, that's how I get promotions and tenure and all of that was in exhibitions, and that's what I wanted to do anyway was producing work for those materials. And that combination uh, allowed advancement in both areas to move very quickly. From the very beginning, EVL was built on relationships between hybrids. DeFonte was wrapping up a PhD in computer science. His dissertation was a new real-time computer graphics programming language called Graphics Symbiosis System, or GRASS. This programming language was intended to be easy for non-computer scientists to use and quickly became popular with artists in the new field of computer graphics. More on that in a bit. Sandine has a bachelor's in natural sciences and a master's in physics, but his experiments with video brought him to UIC's art department in 1969. My first question for him was how he got started with all of this, especially how a nuclear physicist became a world-renowned pioneering artist. The path is, uh, I started out primarily as a, interested in science, uh, physics in particular. Um, and, but I had a, a what prim- primarily was a technical hobby, I guess, of photography. I developed my first roll of film when I was 12 years old and used that instrument uh, to explore the world and to explore the kind of technology of photography. Um, and, uh, but I continued my education in physics up to a master's degree in nuclear physics. Uh, but I discovered that Um, When I was just sitting down idly, uh, I kept thinking more about images and about, um, uh, I I was very excited about abstract movies that I had seen, abstract movie making, Mm -hmm. uh, on off and uh, uh, others. And uh, so I decided since that's what I wanted to think about, that's what I should do somehow. And so I started to retread myself on the art side with getting art exhibitions based on my photography and what have you. Mm-hmm. And ended up um, in 1969 of coming to the uh, School of Art and Design at the University of Illinois at Chicago, then called Chicago Circle, uh, to be able to bring computers and advanced technology into the art curriculum. This is 1969. 
Um, and uh, one of the reasons that department was interested in it uh, was that uh, there were, they were essentially third-generation Bauhaus, and the Bauhaus, one way to describe them is did a synthesis of the craft tradition and industrial manufacturing to kind of invent or augment or retool industrial design. Mm -hmm. And so their idea was to take industrial design and combine it with the cybernetic age mm -hmm. of computers and uh, electronic technology to make a new synthesis of essentially industrial design and, and cybernetics. So that put me in this position of um, being an artist uh, with the job of kind of applying advanced technology to art production. And so that's, uh, that's been what I've been doing forever now, it seems. Um, and the, um, but in addition to just art production, I always thought that, well, doing any art medium really transforms the way you see the world. Sure. And using electronic media because of the immediacy of feedback and, some, and in some sense the ease of doing it, the ease of interacting with it, such a highly interactive, has highly interactive real-time potential, especially in the early 70s, sure. um, that it really transforms one life very fast. So we used to use the phrase of personal transformation through technology as much as we talked about art production, change the way we see the world. Defonte and Sandine met and founded the Circle Graphics Habitat. Pictures and videos I've found from the early years of the Circle Graphics Habitat are nothing short of magical. Groups of what can only be described as techno hippies collaborated on avant-garde live performances, pioneered computer graphics, and created groundbreaking art and technology works. My favorite picture from that era features early members of the Circle Graphics Habitat smiling and laughing together amidst all the technology they amassed to put on a live video and audio performance projected on a wall at UIC. Tom is smiling and holding a monitor with graphics displayed, and Dan is wearing a flashy pirate hat in the middle of the fray, grinning ear to ear. The single weirdest aspect of the Circle Graphics Habitat and later EVL is how unknown it is. Before looking at graduate school, I'd never even heard of UIC, let alone EVL. But I wanted to go somewhere where I could study virtual reality. Many longtime Chicago residents I talked to have never heard of EVL and are surprised to find out about it. Yet EVL is a place of many important firsts and inventions and artworks. The first data glove was created there. The cave virtual reality system was invented there. And a key animation from the original 1977 Star Wars film, Episode IV, A New Hope, was created there. For the groundbreaking 1977 sci-fi film, an artist named Larry Cuba used a later version of the grass programming language called Zgrass to create the scene in New Hope where rebel pilots are being shown a simulation and being briefed on the only way to destroy the Death Star. The simulation is displayed on a screen in a room full of rebel pilots, and it shows them the risky equatorial trench run they're going to have to make on the Death Star that ends with a one in a million shot into a shaft leading to the reactor core. A New Hope was obviously a huge success, and George Lucas gave Tom DeFonte one of the original Death Star tiles used to make the film as a token of his gratitude. To shoot many of the sequences that feature the Death Star in New Hope, tiles like this were laid on the ground or arranged along a tilted platform. During my time at EVL, the Death Star tile was proudly displayed, hung on a wall in a conference room. The tile was handmade, and visitors, students, and staff frequently stared at it in reverence. I certainly did. At around the same time that Tom DeFonte was developing the GRASS programming language, Dan Sandine was inventing the Sandine Image Processor. The Image Processor, or IP, was a patch programmable computer that could be used to manipulate and combine video inputs. Dan has described it as a video version of a Moog audio synthesizer. Right, so uh, it was really an extension of uh, my work in photography uh, because uh, I was... Uh, in addition to taking kind of realistic pictures, I was very interested in abstracting those images. Mm -hmm. And uh, you could, by modifying chemical techniques, especially in color photography, you could change the colors, tone, and uh, the contrast, and of course other things about the image um, by the development exposure and development procedures in the printing step. Um, and uh, I also was interested in using optical modifiers uh, in the printing step of pieces of plastic and shadowing things and things mm -hmm. that are kind of like um, photograms uh, in combination with camera-acquired images. And uh, it, it occurred to me uh, that one could do all of those operations electronically 
um, partially motivated by the tradition of the analog video synthesizer, the Moog Model 2 to be specific, which is the one I worked with, mm-hmm. um, that I realized that any of these processes that I could do with chemicals, uh, at least, and any of the point processes I could do with an instrument like an analog synthesizer, if it could process video signals. So I proceeded to design, um, because of my background in physics and electronics, I was actually in a position to teach myself enough electronic design to go ahead and produce a modular instrument where these modules could process video and so that you could put in video images, let's say for the moment black and white images, Mm -hmm. and then break them up into components and process them differently so that your final result was colorized and abstracted and combined with other video images in real time. Um, and the Circle Graphics Habitat was a basically a combination of that instrument with this holographic display that I was talking about, mm-hmm. where we essentially pointed TV cameras at the face of this holographic display uh, and then did live hybrid performances between digital computers, analog computers, and live music. One of Dan's pieces from that era, Spiral PTL, was one of the first pieces included in the Museum of Modern Art's video collection. Here's Dan again. Yeah, now um, people operating in, let's say, the video area and in, let's say, producing virtual reality uh, experiences and stuff don't find it to be a real-time media because video editing and post-production turns out to be such an important component that you aren't really creating the artwork uh, as uh, you're not actually producing the artwork as you're creating it. It's kind of spread over a bunch of uh, delays. Sure, sure. But in that time, well, first of all, videotape recording um, was uh, lower quality than watching it live, uh, especially with low-cost videotape recorders. Well, I might mention that that's a time period that the port pack became available. Mm-hmm. Before that, the only way you could do let's say, video recording or video art or video production is to be part of a TV station, basically. Sure, sure. Uh, so really no other way to do it. Uh, yeah, yeah. But that, at this time, uh, these uh, things costing as much as a good used car, you could uh, get a porta pack and uh, be able to record. And then the editing equipment was a little more expensive, but with the sharing, uh, uh, with, the record, with the sharing of equipment among small groups, uh, was affordable by individuals and small institutions. But the real-time part was really critical. Um, the, uh, the computers we had at the time uh, would only really operate in real-time in a sense. They, uh, uh, they, they drew pictures on the screen. It's called, they're called holographic displays. Um, and they drew pictures on the screen by taking an electronic beam and painting it like you would drawing with a pencil. Sure, so sure. they're doing that electronically. And then the phosphor would decay away in a 30th of a second or less. So you had to draw it again. Right. right. So since you were drawing it every frame, making it change was relatively trivial. Right. Right. Um, and so you could really do real performance in the sense of a musical performance. You could jam. Uh, you could connect up dials and sliders and uh, buttons to uh, to the system and pursue to perform in kind of the musical tradition, but with visual stuff on the screen. And in the case of electronic visualization events and in a lot of other productions, that uh, was allied with a musical performance, people jamming in, uh, on musical instruments and these performances on, on um, that holographic displays uh, in the Circle Graphics Habitat um, worked well. Circle Graphics Habitat and later EVL also began one of the longest running collaborations between art and technology in the United States. Beginning in the late 70s and up until 2011, students in the School of Art and Design at UIC could earn a Master of Fine Arts with a concentration in electronic visualization. This meant they were getting a traditional studio arts degree, but using or inventing non-traditional media like virtual reality and electronics. So at what point did Circle Graphics Habitat become EVL and what precipitated the name change? Um, I think the date is 1985. We can check that. It may be earlier. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, it had to do with a, a number of a number of changes that was were going on. Um, we were uh, um, now becoming developing a formal relationship with the engineering between the engineering department and the art department, mm-hmm. and we were giving degrees in the art department um, um, in, with a specialty in electronic visualization. So that was the first formal 
collaboration of engineering and art resulting in an advanced degree that we know about. And sure. We had a lot of people would tell us, we hang out with all the people that were doing it in the early days. And so that, uh, that and we moved between buildings, um, and so we just, uh, um, and we kept talking about electronic visualization mm-hmm. as a way to describe our activities, so we decided to call it the Electronic Visualization Laboratory. Kind of lost some of the psychedelic uh, hippie trail that was that Tom and I were both highly involved with uh, sure. in the beginnings of this stuff. But not the spirit. In 1992, EVL released another groundbreaking invention, the Cave Virtual Reality Environment. It was invented at EVL by Carolina Cruz Neira, Dan Sandin, and Tom DeFonte. Most virtual reality researchers and inventors at the time were focusing on head-mounted displays, or HMDs. These were the ancestors to today's Oculus Rifts and HTC Vives. Early HMDs had a bad reputation for causing terrible motion sickness. But the cave was something altogether different. Typically composed of a large cube of rear projection screens, a cave VR environment creates fully immersive VR experiences without the need for a cumbersome HMD. A user in a cave wore stereoscopic LCD shutter glasses. Shutter glasses use a technique called alternating frame sequencing to show alternating left and right views to the viewer, creating the illusion of 3D in depth. Once inside the cave, the user's position and orientation was tracked and a cluster of computers adjusted the stereoscopic image projected on each side of the cave. This ensured that the stereoscopic image was correct for whatever position the user happened to be in while using the cave. Many caves also had a projector pointing downward above the cave, making the illusion continuous across the floor. Many caves also featured multiple speakers positioned around the user, which provided 3D audio that matched the 3D visual components. The artists and computer scientists working and studying at EVL created numerous artworks and scientific applications for the cave. The cave virtual reality system was a huge success, and they continue to be used in various formats today. So what was the impetus behind the development of the cave, the original cave in 92? Yeah, well, that's kind of very interesting. Um, So... These live performances that we were talking about, that technology became outmoded by the end of the 70s mm-hmm. and was supplanted by the frame buffer, which is now the way we think computer graphics is done. Sure. Um, now, in that transition period, computers were too slow to do anything in real time that had to do with a frame buffer because drawing a picture in a frame buffer means being doing millions of operations or at least hundreds of th- in the beginning, and hundreds of thousands of operations to make right. even a low-resolution image. Um, and so it was, was it kind of impossible, except for very restricted cases, uh, to do real-time performance with frame buffers. The exceptions had one thing to do with the video games industry, which I learned uh, through a concept called sprites, to be able to essentially move small areas of the screen. Uh, we used to call them space roaches, but... Uh, you could take small areas of the screen and move them around in real time. And they had specialized hardware for doing a number of things to support a real-time activity. And Tom, in particular, and I to a lesser extent, collaborated with the video games industry to try to take advantage of those hardware improvements that were made in terms of video games. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then towards the end of the uh, 80s, um, this period essentially extended from 1970 to 1980 towards the uh, towards the uh, end of, excuse me, yeah, through the 70s, towards the end of the 80s uh, with the invention of uh, chips that are kind of like the equivalent of the GPU cards now that are in computers, uh, real-time computer graphics became possible again. Mm-hmm. That you could, these things could draw things to frame buffers fast enough to do things in real time. And so then we were seeing this again and said, well, what do we do with that? That's what we always really wanted to do. And now there's kind of in principle based equipment to do it. Um, and uh, so we, we, we took that equipment, and this would be in the 80s, uh, and used it to support science through creating animations, but also creating systems where people could investigate their data in real time, mm-hmm. be able to manipulate images, look at them from various directions. Um, and um, so we wanted to make that more interactive and we wanted to move away from a small screen. Um, and so we decided to uh, look at VR uh, because there were a couple of head-mounted displays becoming available there. And, of course, the VR concept had been fully illustrated in the late 60s right. um, by Ivan Sutherland, and we were all familiar with that. And we thought, well, that's maybe a place we should push our direction. 
We looked at that for a while, but we've been working primarily with video projection on large screens like we did for these performances. Right. Uh, and now um, my consulting business at that time had to do with teaching computer companies how to do standard video so they could plug into these new video devices. That was um, a lot of the uh, computer companies had no concept about how wonderful and sophisticated and amazing these what seemed to them weird decisions like, uh, well, why don't they have 512 lines? Why do they have 480 and 640 and mm -hmm. all these screwy numbers? And so I was one of the people that was teaching them why those numbers are important and why you should do them right. uh, so that you would be compatible with standard TV. Um, and so now some instruments were compatible with standard TV. And we've probably been working on large screens. Um, and we just said, well, you know, we're doing virtual reality. Could we do, we head mouse play, could we do that by surrounding people with screens? First thing that struck me about that was that um, I knew that would be amazingly powerful because these immersive, I did light shows in the 70s. Excuse me for hitting the mic. I did light, school, light shows in the 70s with rock bands and we had like projectors all over the place. Right. Um, actually, in the 60s, I guess it would be a better description there. Um, and... Um, so I knew that kind of environment can be incredibly powerful. And so that was great. So then the issue became, could one do all the properties of virtual reality by surrounding people with screens that weren't on your head? Um, and uh, I had been working in an area of auto stereo uh, where I had to create off-axis perspective corrections to make this auto stereo, and a stereo without glasses work. That's actually a research effort that I'd been working in since the 60s too, which is stereo without glasses. That's both mm -hmm. a technical and aesthetic goal. Um, and so I knew how to do those projections and it became very clear with about a half hour of noodling that absolutely, that all the standard operations of computer graphics could be done on screens, let's say arrayed at right angles to each other and produce images without seams if you knew where the viewer was. Right. Another thing that made that seem realistic were all of these kind of um, tour de force perspective uh, explorations done in the Renaissance where you'd stand in a corner and look at an intersection of three walls and if you were in the right place, all the 3D worked right. So I knew it worked for mono because they did it in the Renaissance. Um, and uh, then the issue became, could it do in stereo? Because my experience with auto stereo at that time, the answer was yes. And so then we decided, okay, so let's go down and play in that path. Uh, and, that, um, and that evolved into the classic cave, which was uh, a cube, um, three screens, uh, and a floor, typically, was the classic cave. Um, and uh, the cave, uh, the, the cube, rather than something like the sphere, where people say, well, you didn't do it on a sphere. And it's like projectors like to work on flat surfaces. Right. Um, and, uh, and computer graphics perspective likes to project the flat surfaces, so that that became the arrangement. Mm -hmm. Uh, and again, but again, all of this is primarily put into the service of both science and art, where uh, allowing people to interact with their display with all this rich feedback um, was very powerful. Because you can think of VR, I think of VR in two basic ways. One um, is that it's a new medium of expression like radio or television or film. Mm -hmm. uh, you view it from the art world and it has affordances, it has things you can do in there that you can't do in any other medium. Mm -hmm. uh, it has limitations, too. Um, another way to think about it is just an improvement in the human-computer interface. Right. Um, I, mean, I mean, if somebody, I used to say, if somebody dug up a, a, you know, a standard computer room and from that, like an anthropologist, tried to decide how, how, what people were like that used that, you know, they'd come out that, well, they only had one eye and maybe one tinny ear and 200 fingers and no feet. Mm -hmm. um, it just doesn't connect with the human in a very direct way at all. It's all very abstracted and very limited. Sure. VR has a better way of interacting with the human. First of all, it knows, it does stereo, it knows where people's head are, so it can do the correct perspective. You move your head, you see things. You, know, you move your head to the side, you see the side of something. Right. And you move around something, you see its front. Um, and that's a very natural way to interact with something rather than 90 mouse actions to like rotate an object around or something. Right. Um, and the uh, stereo is important because it helps you, especially in, say, complex three-dimensional things, which often you get into in engineering and science and in art. It allows you to see depth better, and it uh, mm -hmm. makes, makes you understand whether two things actually will run into each other or not. And then, of course, real-time interaction, which is, part, of course, part of standard computer graphics. So you put all those things together, and you can produce an environment where science, scientists can explore their data 
uh, and engineers can explore their engineering models in a way that's much more efficient and much quicker and much better than a small display on a desktop. As we mentioned earlier, the head-mounted display is the dominant type of VR found in current consumer electronics. Some of the issues that existed in head-mounted displays of the early 1990s have been mitigated by improvements in technology, but still have some critical limitations. Yeah, of course, those problems you talk about are still here um, in a different degree, and I can talk about them when we talk about uh, the VR now. Mm -hmm. so, but talking about you know VR then... Um, one of the primary problems was the resolution was incredibly low, like as low as 2200. I like to talk about acuity rather than resolution piece of measures, how the eye responds to the visual environment. Sure. And the early, um, early head-mounted displays were operating at 2200 or thereabouts. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, that's legally blind territory. Oh, wow. Yeah. So very low resolution was one of the major problems. And the other thing you point out is that the tracking in both the cave and in head-mounted displays was quite latent and quite poor. And the cave was uh, 200 times less sensitive to head rotation at arm's length, 200 times less sensitive to head rotation than a head-mounted display, so that we could use you know, uh, this, uh, similar tracking technology, but its effect on the human was mm -hmm. much milder. Uh, and so it was a much more... Uh, much, you know, much more comfortable display uh, to move around in and stuff. Um, so that's uh, that's certainly true. And but those those things I'm talking about are still true today. Just increase the numbers. Sure. Um, but part uh, probably one of the most important reasons I think that we we found the cave powerful after we started to work with it in comparison to head-mounted displays. Um, was its support of small group interaction. Now, a tremendous amount of stuff in the world is done in small groups. Right. Uh, science is primarily done in small groups. Uh, it's not the lone scientist working by himself. He's like working with colleagues and experts in different areas, and they're constantly working together. And in a cave, you're in a small room, or in the case of Cave 2, you're in a reasonable-sized room, and you can be standing with people, or in the Cave 2, sitting down at a desk and... and uh, interacting with people and the virtual reality environment in a seamless way that supports group and small group interaction very well. And so that, I think, is probably the, um, the biggest reason that caves became successful uh, was because, first of all, they did support these VR properties, which are very powerful as a better interface to the computer graphics world, and that means your data world. Um, and, uh, but the second part was that it supported small group interaction. Dan has continued to innovate and discover new territory in virtual reality. In the last 15 years, consumer VR has seen yet another rise in popularity. This time, the desire for stereoscopic 3D experiences developed in two parallel tracks. The first is in 3D movies. This led to a drive to produce 3D TVs for home viewing. Unfortunately, 3D TVs in homes were not well received. In January 2017, the last two major television manufacturers still producing 3D TVs, Sony and LG, announced they would stop all 3D support. However, 3D movies and theaters continue to be popular. The other track, as mentioned before, has been a new generation of head-mounted displays. Google Cardboard, Oculus Rift, HTC Vive, and Magic Leap are just a few of the head-mounted displays currently available. Despite the growing popularity of these new head-mounted displays, they are far from ubiquitous technologies in homes. Many schools are eager to incorporate VR into their curriculum, but so many questions remain about the efficacy of VR in the classroom. I was curious about what Dan thought of modern VR. Well, first of all, uh, I'd like to just talk about uh, the relationship between head-mounted displays and caves. Um, I mean, first of all, my definition of VR has to do with, uh, one of the definitions I have of VR has to do with, you know, what visual and interactive modalities does it support. And both the head-mounted displays and caves do stereo, which is an important feature of VR. Um, 
they do viewer-centered perspective. This is interesting because it's the first reinvention of perspective since the Renaissance. Mm -hmm. And that is in a VR environment, you're getting your view of the world, not the narrator's or the camera's view of the world. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a first-person experience. Um, it's viewer-centered perspective. You see the world from your position. And that's both supported both by head-mounted displays and by caves. A uh, third important and one people I think think of first is visual immersion, where you uh, uh, where the environment surrounds you, the, uh, the what you're looking at it doesn't have a frame around it. Something has a frame around it. You know it's not real. It's got a frame around it. Um, so both those support immersion, visual immersion, both in the sense of wide angles of view for the eye, and in the sense of being able to look around. Uh, both uh, support that. They have different biases of how well they support these various features, and we can talk about them maybe in, when we discuss uh, the, the future work. But the big point I want to make is that for the important aspects of VR, uh, the cave and the head-mounted displays are equal uh, in the principles they support. They just support them at different quality levels, mm -hmm. and they have in detail different affordances, but they're both you know, full VR environments. Um, now, one of the nice ones, we moved to the Cave 2, and the Cave 2 is a 20-foot diameter cylinder with an uh, arrangement of panels. Um, and uh, so it uh, essentially has less vertical angle of view than, let's say, the classic Cave has or as head-mounted displays have. Uh, when you get close to the screens, your angle of view can go get quite high mm -hmm. because you get close to the screens, they intercept, but not quite going vertical and horizontal. There are Cave... There are arrangements of caves, for instance, the Sun Cave, which I worked on. I didn't participate much in the development of, but I use uh, that Tom DeFonte and Greg Daw, which both were from EVL, moved to uh, UCSD, developed. You do have good look up and look down. Um, so it's not a limitation of the panels itself. It's a limitation of how you decide to arrange the panels. Uh, and of course, one of the big problems with panels is that they're square. And it's very high to, hard to tile a sphere with squares, but uh, they actually did a pretty good job of it out at, uh, Tom did a pretty good job, Tom and Greg did a pretty good job with it uh, out at uh, Qualcomm Institute at UCSD mm -hmm. um, um, for getting top and down. But it is immersed in three directions. In the horizontal direction, it goes all the way around, but except for a door-sized gap. And then behind that gap is a set of flat panels, so the image actually continues, and if you're head tracked, mm -hmm it all lines up properly. Uh, so it gives you full immersion in that direction. Okay, so enough about that. Now going back to your question, what I think about the future of stuff, I think, um, so both, both, both versions of VR are gonna go through you know, quality increases and uh, cost reductions or price performance ratio increases mm -hmm. in the near future. Um, now, a lot of things in the technical world that seem to be, you know, technical advantages don't end up being dominant consumer products. So whether head-mounted display VR is going to expand um, into a big segment um, or whether, for instance, the head-mounted uh, VR is going to be reduced to, let's say, um, a niche market or... Uh, it certainly will be successful in a, in a bunch of commercial applications because mm -hmm. its advantages are profound for a whole bunch of a whole bunch of things, um, and especially in the augmented reality environment. Mm -hmm. um, certainly going to be successful in commercial environments. How much it becomes a consumer thing, you don't know. It's hard to predict. For instance, uh, color TV when it was you know introduced in the '60s, I guess. Is that right? Um, you know, it took a decade before it became a consumer. It was slow, much slower than anybody thought it would be. Right. And had these kind of chicken and egg problems. So you can have things that eventually become dominant but take very long times. You can also think things that come and go, you know, like stereo, 3D TV, oh, stereo yeah. in general, although stereo movies are still successful. Right. So nobody's making a stereo TV anymore right. in the consumer realm. Uh, and that, so that's come up and failed three or four times, three times at least. Yeah, three times the way stereo researchers think about it. Mm -hmm. It's never made it to the consumer realm. Um, so it's hard to predict whether um, the head mount display will make it in the consumer environment um, or whether it'll be a niche activity. Caves and projection based displays, because of their um, large cost, 
um, will continue to be successful and expand in um, in com- commercial and educational environments mm-hmm. um, because of the affordances it gives. And uh, the concept here, uh, I think uh, uh, Andy Johnson and uh, Jason Lee, Jason Lee, who was uh, director of the lab after Tom and I left, and Andrew Johnson, who's currently director of research here and uh, has been a principal, has been a, first a student in the organization and now a professor later, kind of uh, pioneered this concept of hybrid reality systems. And these mm-hmm. things that are, that are in the Cave 2 as an example, um, essentially a combination of large flat displays, uh, because getting big displays in classrooms is now becoming more and more common, these tile displays, so sure. people can actually read the text sitting in the back seat. Um, and uh, making them um, also have properties of VR, which is stereo and head-mounted, uh, stereo and viewer center perspective. Um, in monos- monoscopy, is actually fairly straightforward. Stereo is a little bit of a harder problem. So there's also that world mm-hmm. of hybrid displays. Um, and so I think that market's going to expand dramatically because the cost of displays goes way down. Um, because consumer TVs are this incredible piece of technology, and if you can make your wall out of them, uh, you've got uh, you've got a relatively inexpensive system. When you if you consider it per person in the room, sure, um, that has tremendous qualities. Um, so augmented reality is another aspect that's important and becoming more important in um, in virtual reality. It's you can think of it as a part of virtual reality or think of it as a separate thing, but it shares a lot of technology. Right. And of course, augmented reality is where the physical reality gets mixed with the computer graphics reality in various ways. Mm-hmm. So caves can be thought of as being augmented reality inside of the cave oh, wow. and virtual reality outside of the cave. Um, and so uh, it ha- also has both of those properties. One of the things you get um, out of these... Um, out of mixed reality displays or augmented reality displays, this will see other people and stuff, and that's one of the things mm-hmm. that makes small groups work so well. So you have very high quality head-mounted augmented reality displays um, that could do everything in a sensible way. You could get some of that property back. So you could imagine several people separated in head-mounted displays being able to interact the way they do in caves, with the advantage of them not having to be co-located. Mm-hmm. Um, but having the disadvantage is that that kind of connection will never be as rich as standing next to a person, um, because that's you know that's we uh, we are very good at identifying things about the people standing next to us in terms of their emotional state, uh, when they want attention, when they're willing to listen, mm-hmm. uh, what you're saying is they're getting it or they're not getting it. All of that you get by subtle interactions with people. It's going to be hard. Um, or it'll take a time, a good length of time before augmented reality um, will be able to allow co-located people to have as rich an interaction as people standing around in in a room in, you know, can have. For artists like Dan, existing tools have not been enough. Throughout his entire career, he has invented new media for his own personal expression and to empower others to express themselves in new ways. But why not just paint or sculpt? Why did he move beyond his early experiments with photography to invent new media for creativity? Um, well, I mean, for me, I mean, when I started off, the way I used to kind of think about it is that, well, I'm a, you know, I've got I'm an electronic designer, and I've got or I have potential to become an electronic designer. Um, I actually became that through the, through actually designing the analog image process. Although I built electronic projects. Uh, you know, when I was a teenager, I was in ham radio, and I built radios, and I mm-hmm. built radio transmitters, and so I'd had some experience there, but, um, m- you know, and I understood how things were, mostly copying other people's designs, so I had to learn something to become that. And I was also very technically impl- inclined. I had, you know, powerful technical capabilities. I knew a lot of science. I knew a lot of technology. And I was very interested in doing images. Mm-hmm. And uh, my history of doing things, I mean, I think I failed finger painting and grade school, mm-hmm. uh, and you give me a marking device and a, mark, and a place to mark, and I make a mess. And so that that was not a way. Photography, of course, uses instrumentalities, and I actually did things there that I thought were interesting mm-hmm. uh, anyway, that I looked at and you know allowed me to see the world in a different way. Um, so uh, it was actually fairly natural for me 
Then that, of course, got augmented or perhaps even forced by the fact that I was in an art department and my success was going to be judged by an exhibition. Right. To be able to combine my, what I was good at with the art world in order to make my career work. Mm -hmm. uh, so there were a lot of forces uh, that, uh, that were operating. Looking in retrospect, there were a lot of forces that made that the logical direction. Uh, from the inside, it was just I was extremely excited about doing things that other people hadn't done before. The kinds of I was, thing I liked most was seeing images I had never seen before. And I mean that not just in the detail of you know, how well an object is rendered, but nothing like it has been seen before, right? Right. And so that interested me. And so that's what got me. In, and, and electronics, um, you know, uh, and video, and, you know, the, the video technology becoming uh, consumer available in terms of uh, production um, was just a very powerful place to explore. Right. Um, and uh, though my promotion and tenure came uh, from exhibitions, um, the money mainly came from science. Right. So, uh, the, um, so that meant that uh, I would, uh, if there was a technical challenge, uh, I would convert it into an art project because that uh, got me points in both categories. Right. Uh, and also, I would get bored if I'm not doing for not seeing things that are new and interesting to me, I get bored with the project. So that's been my path as I take up technical challenges. In some cases, they're image-related. In some cases, they're pure technology. And convert them into an art project uh, and uh, try to make progress in both domains at once. Dan Sandine, Tom DeFonte, and everyone who made Circle Graphics Habitat and later EVL what it is today preferred the technological horizon to the safe harbor of what is known and understood. Dan and Tom have a philosophy that explains that long track record of innovation. Um, and then there was also the thing that Tom and I, as a strategy, um, always like to go at right angles to everyone else. I mean, mm -hmm. we look at the way the world's going, we see where the limits are, and Tom is just uncanny about identifying directions to do research that would make great progress fast and kind of wasn't in direct competition with people, especially at that time, which we were just beginning. We were young professors. We were just beginning. We were at a second-class university. Uh, our funding was very low, mm -hmm. uh, in competition with the best people in the world. And we have always uh, one of Tom's, uh, Tom Defani's uh, great gifts is understanding the technical world and uh, understanding how science is done, um, and be able to you know go in directions that are very powerful. So we used to phrase it as say, well, the way we stay ahead of everybody else is to go at right angles to everybody else. And then measured on our axis, we're always ahead of everybody else. Right. And, but this was a case where, and we've done this several times before, um, consciously, where it's like the other people are going to the head-mounted display technology, um, but this other technology we think would be better. And also, we're actually in a position to work on it. Uh, and uh, we, aren't, we aren't in competition with world-class universities, the big budgets that know NSF better than we do. Right. Um, and so that was, uh, that's part of the game and uh, part of the direction. It was very successful. Thanks for listening to the Depth and Light podcast. We'll be back in two weeks with the second part of this story. If you like this or other episodes, please consider writing a review on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. For more information about Depth and Light, check out our website at depthandlight.com. That's D-E-P-T-H-A-N-D-L-I-G-H-T.com. Or follow us on Instagram and Twitter via the handle at depthandlight.